Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. I'm uh, Chaplain Steve Stogard. I am a chaplain at the hospital here on base, and today I am also your probationary assistant chaplain or pastor. Good morning. I want to welcome you to our Protestant service and invite you to join in our worship with us today. So any visitors, I want to welcome you. We're not here to embarrass anybody, but if you, we do have connection cards, which our ushers could bring to you. In fact, if you would like one, just lift your hand and they will make sure that you get one if you didn't on the way in. Okay, then I would like to bring a few things to your attention from our bulletin. First of all, we have a remembrance of service for Clifford Fields. He was a brother and longtime chapel member. Uh, Colonel Fields passed away on the 20th of May, and his funeral will be held here at the Belvoir Chapel on 22 June at 1500, with a visitation starting at 1400. Um, interment will be at Arlington National Cemetery at a later date. Uh, I see here we have John Hoffman's 80th birthday, June 16th. So if anyone would like to send a card, there's an address in the bulletin. And apparently we still need volunteers for our children's classes. Please contact Hygen at the email listed there. And there is a White Sulphur Springs summer retreat. White Sulphur Springs is the Officers Christian Fellowship uh, Retreat Center up in uh, Pennsylvania. I've been up there, it's an amazing place. I can also vouch for the food they serve, it is really good. And uh, say hi to my daughter, she's up there working for the summer with their outdoor th events. Anyway, this would be on 19 to 26 July, and it's a summer retreat, Enhancing Your Marriage, The Power of the 90 Degree Dynamic. And we'd love to have you join us up there. So contact John Rossi for more information. Also, it has come to my attention that there, is a, that there is a missing unicorn. So if somebody knows who this unicorn belongs to, it's really cute, and we'd like to see it get back to its rightful owner. <laughs> I think we found it. Oh, good, good. So let us turn now to our worship and invocation. Our worship scripture today I'm sorry, I didn't have it listed right in front of me. Do we have a reader for the scripture? Pastor, I lost that one. You missed one? I don't have the scripture here. See, I'm probationary today. He's going to grab one for me. Thank you, Pastor. Our call to worship is from Hebrews chapter 12. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape 
if we reject him who warns from heaven. At this time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Let us pray. Almighty God. Oh, you need a breath. Yes, <laughs> Almighty God, as we gather as your people today to worship you and learn of you, we ask you to sanctify us through the truth of your word and our fellowship with your people. Be glorified in us today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, stand if you are able and let us join in our opening hymn. I've sanctuary. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord God, you are great and mighty and wonderful. And we adore you and we lift our prayers of adoration before you. Let our hearts rise up in praise. Let our minds be set on you. May every word that we lift up be glorifying to you. For you, Lord God, are amazing. You are holy, you are mighty, and you are worthy of all our praise and adoration. And let us pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please welcome one another in the grace and peace of Christ.
let's publicly affirm the central doctrines of our faith found in the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's go to the Lord for a period of intercession, of silent confession, and words of assurance and pardon. Lord God, I lift up the needs of our congregation before you. I know that there are some who are hurting or in need of healing. I pray you would give them healing and comfort. Some are grieving, and I pray they would sense your presence and that you would be with them and walk through them in this time. I know many among us are moving, uh, packing, transitioning, and that can be stressful. I ask, Lord, that you would be helping them, and giving them assurance and comfort and allowing them to not be anxious in these situations. For you are going to go with them wherever they go. I know this from your word. And Father, if there's any other needs, you know the heart, you know the mind, and I pray you would hear them even as they are silently lifted to you. Now, Lord, please hear our confession of sins. So hear our prayers, Lord, as we silently confess our personal sins during a few moments of silence. Dear Father, we give thanks that we have in Christ ultimate and eternal pardon for our sins, as are assured of in passages such as Romans 8. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Thank you, Father, for the ultimate forgiveness we have in Christ. Now please stand if you are able for our declaration of faith. Hymn 712, Be Still My Soul.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your holy word says that each person should give what they have decided in their heart to give, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Thank you, Lord, for the giving today and may it be used for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Please be seated. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the children are now dismissed to Children's Church. Okay. Our scripture reading today will be by Mr. Steve Christensen. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Father's Day is applicable. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 10 through 17. Listen 
for the word of the Lord. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pashan. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Our New Testament reading comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 18. Again, listen for the word of the Lord. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak. Be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. As it says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Chaplain? Just me. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. I uh, just, again, want to take a, a brief moment to uh, wish all the dads out there a very happy Father's Day. Uh, although we're not going to set aside our sermon today, our, our sermon series, to do a Father's Day uh, sermon, there, there are some very clear ties in what we're going to be talking about today, our third series in how to understand and apply the will of God to, uh, to the role of the father. Because we're going to talk about God's design in growing moral awareness, moral understanding, and an understanding of God's will in his children, in us, which is very much the role of a father for his children, to teach them how to think, how to discern, and how to conduct themselves wisely in the world. So I think there's some, there's some very clear ties there to fatherhood. Now, the common assumption in much of modern American Christianity is that somehow I have to find God's will for my life. Uh, the belief is that when I'm faced with a decision where I have to choose between, you know, two or more, I have to choose one of two or more options, then only one of those things can be God's will, and the other things are definitively not God's will for me. And I, I better get it right, because if I mistake, if I make a mistake and I choose the wrong one, then I am out of God's will. And at best, if I do that, I'm going to miss out on the blessings God wanted to lavish on me if I'd chosen the right one. But it's also possible that God's going to be really angry, angry with me for not discerning the right one, not discerning his will correctly. And maybe he's going to punish me because I went left instead of right or up instead of down because God's a tyrant. So the image we've had is uh, one of a, like a dark and dangerous forest. And God's told us, hey, you've got to navigate through to the other side of that forest. But he didn't give us a good map. And uh, instead, there's just this sort of poorly marked path 
and I gotta pick my way through the woods, and if I step off the path, even for a moment, even by accident, then, then you know, the wolves are gonna get me. And if I, I'm never gonna find that path again. I think that's sometimes the, the, the idea we have about how this, this idea, this thing of finding God's will for our lives actually works out. Now my hope today is to replace that model of finding God's will with a different one. Not a faint trail through a dangerous forest, but an altogether different model for understanding and knowing God's will. Now notice that I did not say they're finding God's will. Understanding and knowing and applying God's will. Because I think that this whole idea of finding God's will is a concept that is foreign to the Bible. It's not in there. The will of God has already been revealed to us. We don't need to find it. We just need to do it and be it. That's why two weeks ago we spent a, a good chunk of our time discussing what it means to be created in God's image. The reason God created us was to bear his image. And because that's why he created us, then we can say that that is his will for us. We were created to bear God's image well. The Westminster Catechism, we talked about it too, said the chief end of man is to do what? Glorify God and enjoy him forever. Ecclesiastes echoes this thought when at the end of the book, the writer of Ecclesiastes summarizes his whole exploration of what's the purpose, what's the meaning of life. He says this, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And then last week we talked about how sin marred the image of God in us. And it clouded our understanding of God's desire for us, desires for us. And that's why in Romans it tells us that we need to have a transformed mind before we can test and approve and discern what is God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. So in other words, if we're going to understand what God wants from us, we need to change our way of thinking so that it corresponds to the way that God thinks. I need to learn how to think God's thoughts after him. And the way to do that is by living lives of obedience to God. So there's this kind of circular logic to it, right? We know and understand God's will for our lives by doing God's will for our lives. I obey that shapes my character, and then that in turn gives me discernment into what God would want me to do in a particular circumstance. So I begin to understand what God wants from me in the big picture stuff by being obedient to him in the little things in my daily life. See, I want to be able to turn to a single verse in scripture and have it tell me what I want to know. What job should I take? Well, that's here in second hesitations, whatever. You know, it doesn't, that's not there. It doesn't exist. I, I'm, I'm not always going to be able to find answers to questions about my unique circumstances in a particular verse of Scripture. Knowing and understanding God's will means having an understanding of the entirety of Scripture, how the Bible works. I'm much more likely to find those answers by understanding what the Bible teaches as a whole. Now, the first step in this development is to understand how to think within the framework of the worldview that the Bible spells out for us and the values that it teaches us to, to uh, treasure. How do I have a transformed mind? Well, know and obey the will, the word of God. Then I will be able to discern what's going on in these circumstances and choose wisely. See, theologians talk about the will of God in two different ways. All right. A, a major problem for us is that we often confuse those two different ways, and then we get confused about our role in each of those things. Right? So theologians talk about God having a sovereign will, a decree, and then God having a moral will. And where we start to struggle is this, because we talked about sometimes, or talked about last week, the commands in Scripture are all about God's moral will for us, right? How I live my life out. God's concern is that we become the kind of people God wants us to be. That is, we live the lives of godliness and righteousness. 
That's how we start to live out the renewing of our minds. So we said that last week that God's will for our lives is primarily a moral will. It's not a list of tasks that I need to accomplish. God's concern for us is who we become more than what we happen to be doing with our lives. So in that sense, we don't have to find God's will. It's already been revealed. Our responsibility is to do God's moral will in whatever the circumstances happen to be in which I find myself. And the faithful people of biblical Israel in the early church understood God's will this way. Obey truth. Obey the truths and instructions that God has revealed as his desire for his people. In other words, God gives instructions to his people because following them is God's will. Make sense? All right. So they were more concerned with growing in their understanding of God's revelation and, and living according to the standards they knew pleased God more than trying to attain additional information about the future. They didn't view God as like a cosmic fortune teller or a divine Ouija board. So they understood this distinction between God's moral will and God's sovereign will. They knew that their responsibility was doing God's moral will and that God's sovereign will, or what's going to happen to me in my future, that wasn't their chief concern. That was God's realm. My job is to be obedient and faithful in the midst of whatever happens. So let's look at a few passages of scripture that actually use the will of God. You wanna talk about the will of God? Okay, we're gonna look up that phrase, the will of God. Where does that, what does it have to say in Scripture about this? So we're going to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. All right, here we go. For this is the will of God. Ready? Your sanctification. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own bodies in holiness and honor. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So in this case, we, we could dive into the specifics of this. I'm not interested, I mean, well, I am interested, but I, our, our sermon today is not going to to focus on the specifics here, but rather on the characterization of what we're talking about, okay? In this case, we have a statement. This is the will of God, followed by what? Instructions for moral living, right? It's God's will that you should fulfill these moral instructions so that you can achieve sanctification. Make sense? All right, now one chapter to the right, 1 Thessalonians 5. We just read this in our scripture reading. Okay, starting in verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It's very clear. Notice this is not about choices you are making. This is about your character. This is about how you live your life. So here we have this series of instructions for moral living, and then the statement that this is the will of God. Do these things. Be like this, because this is God's will for you. Again, the focus here is on behavior, not on finding out what your future holds. Same thing here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Okay? Be subject to the Lord's sake, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Why? For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So in this passage, we're in the middle of a long section of the book of First Peter, where Peter's giving instructions about how to live out godly relationships. 
And in this case, he's writing about a godly attitude toward those who are in authority over us. And he says that God's will is that we should do good. It's, it's right there. What's God's will? Do good. And in context here, it's evident that the good we are to do is submission to authority. That's something we don't like to talk about a whole lot in our society right now. Now, in all of these passages, the context of the verses tells you exactly what the will of God is. Do these things because this is God's will. And this is the way that the Bible consistently represents understanding God's will. It's right there. God's will is about doing the things God instructs us to do, not about discovering what God has in store for me in the future. Doing God's will isn't a search for unrevealed information that I want in order to make a decision. Instead, it's about conforming my attitude and my behavior to what God has already taught us. Now, there are other passages that talk about the will of God that don't actually use that phrase, the will of God, right? But we understand that. Or, or, um, so, for example, um, there are passages that would, would talk about the will of God as something we need to know or to be filled with or to understand. And those sorts of phrases have caused many people to think that these are terms that mean I need to find it. But that understanding, again, isn't accurate. It isn't true to those biblical contexts. The passages that are, these passages are not invitations to obtain new information. They encourage us to engage the information we already have. They're about the believer's growth in obedience to God's revealed truth. For example, let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So here, Paul prays that the believers in the church of Colossae would be filled with the knowledge of God. Now, when we think about filling something, what do we think about? I think about like a glass, a cup, and taking a pitcher and pouring the water and filling it up, right? So there's something that wasn't there before, and now it's being added. So maybe that means I need to find God's will, right? But that's not the way that Paul is using the word here. Paul uses the word fill an awful lot in his writings. Be filled with something. In Romans 1, he talks about being filled with unrighteousness. In Romans 15, he talks about being filled with knowledge. In 2 Corinthians, uh, he talks about being filled with com full of comfort. In Ephesians, filled with the fruits of righteousness. Uh, or, I'm sorry, in Ephesians with the Spirit, with the fruits of righteousness in Philippians, and filled with joy in 2 Timothy. Now, when you read those passages, it becomes pretty clear that what Paul is talking about is that he wants these things to characterize us. These aren't things I need to attain. These are things that should characterize me. So when Paul uses the word filled by, he means characterized by. So I want you to be characterized by your knowledge of the word of God, of the will of God. You already know it. Now be full of it. Be overflowing with it. Paul's desire is that our lives would be characterized by the spiritual truth that we already know. Do God's will. Become godly because you don't have to search for it or find something that's already been revealed to you. So God has a sovereign will and he has a moral will. And we've only sort of touched on this idea of the sovereign will because that's ultimately something that is out of our hands. We see it all over the place. Whatever happens is God's sovereign will. It is his decree. It is his plan. We see it in the scripture in, in God's kind of supervision of our life circumstances. We see it in his unfolding of his plan for redemption of his people. That's God's sovereign will. And we're going to look at one passage in this case. But I think that this bit of scripture is a good example of the Bible's take on the whole idea of trying to discern and know God's sovereign will. So let's take a look at James chapter 4. 
verses 13 through 17. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. See, the, the early Christians understood that their days were ordered according to God's plan, his sovereign will, his decree. And that, that knowledge of that belonged to God alone. They didn't even know what would happen tomorrow. James says, and to pretend to, well, he calls it evil boasting. We don't know what God is up to sometimes. It's not always our place to know. We can speculate, we can pray, we can, we can try and figure it out, but man, every time I have tried to do that, I have been wrong. And then I learned that God's plan was better than what I would have wanted in the first place. It's not our place to know that all the time. Our place, our job, our responsibility is to be faithful regardless of what comes. And this is especially true when things are not going the way that we thought they would. One of the favorite verses people put on graduation cards for kids who are graduating from high school or college is uh, uh, Jeremiah 29:11. right? I know the ways, I know the plans I have for you. It's all like, hey, God's got nothing but good things in store for you. But the context of that verse where it's written, do you know what's going on? Jerusalem is being destroyed. The country is falling to a foreign adversary. People are being dragged off into exile and enslavement. And that's in the midst of that God speaks and he says, don't worry, I know what I'm doing. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope in the future. Don't judge your circumstances by what you see. Trust me with this. In the midst of it, what's your job, Israel? Be faithful. Obey. See, the early Christians didn't try to figure out the content of God's sovereign will. They submitted to the circumstances of their lives as part of God's overall control. They exercised their responsibility to the best of their ability, and then they rested in the results as part of God's plan. See, God makes known his moral will in biblical teaching about our attitudes and our behaviors. He gives instructions, and then believers are responsible to intentionally conform their behavior to what God expects of them. Let's say that again, right? He gives instruction, and then believers are responsible to intentionally conform their behaviors to what God expects of them. It sounds a little bit like some of the instructions I give my kids sometimes. It sounds a little bit like a dad trying to teach his kids how to grow and mature and be wise. And that process enables that transformation of the mind that we talked about last week. The Bible doesn't present a model of searching for God's will in order to make decisions. Instead, the pattern is I respond to God's teaching and I use that teaching to order my life. Okay, so where does this leave us? That's all some good, sounds some good theology, good stuff. I still have to make a choice. What do I do with this? I'm still, I still feel stuck. I'm still sometimes stuck with a difficult decision and I don't know which option God would have me to take. And maybe like my friend that I've been telling you guys about the last couple of weeks, my friend Steffi, who had to choose between two different jobs, she's trying to decide whether to take that job in California or that job in Missouri, and that's all well and good that I'm supposed to be obedient, but I don't know how. Many of the decisions that we face in life don't fall neatly into direct statements we can find in Scripture. And this is kind of what we've been building to for these last three weeks. It's my hope, frankly, that we can learn to relax a little bit. 
about a lot of these things because I, I really don't think it's God's desire for us to be all twisted up in knots and terrified to make a choice, terrified uh, of uh, screwing up my life because I made a mistake. I don't believe that decisions about what house to buy or what job I should take or, or who I should marry require a biblical proof text. Biblical values have to shape those decisions, but I don't need a burning bush to tell me what to do. God gave me a brain and he planted godly desires in my heart so that I can partner with him in these choices. So I need to process life issues, big decisions from a biblical values system and not appeal to God to reveal his will or to give me some sort of omniscient insight into the future. That is God's domain, it's not mine. Remember, you bear God's image like we talked about the first week, but you are not God himself. I might not have a proof text or a specific chapter and verse that directly applies to the choice that I have to make, but what I do have is biblical teaching. I do have a worldview that gives me some sound guidance for decisions that I have to face. And this is all part of God's plan to develop us as we bear his image. So what I want to do now is present to you what I believe to be a biblical model for decision making. Okay? It has nothing to do with finding God's will. It has everything to do with applying it to the circumstances I'm happen, I happen to face. So let's look at again at my friend, Sheffy. She was about to graduate from college, her degree in elementary education. She'd been offered two different jobs, each teaching elementary children, but at different schools in different states. And she was paralyzed by this decision because she felt that she needed to find God's will in this choice before she could pick one. She was waiting for a clear and definitive sign from God before she could make a choice. And she waited. And she waited. And eventually, the schools got tired of her waiting. And both schools hired somebody else. Because she was thinking about this whole thing wrongly. She was waiting for God to, do, to reveal his sovereign will. And God wasn't going to do that. He'd already revealed his moral will, and he expected her to reason from that, from what he had revealed, and wisely apply that rationale and make a decision. He does this because he loves us enough to allow us a say in the course of our lives and desires us to grow in wisdom through learning, to think through and apply biblical thinking to our circumstances. So as long as we're not violating God's moral will, I have freedom to make choices and have them be real choices. And there's consequences and there's fallout. There's, there's good and bad from all of those choices, but they're really genuinely my choices. So the model's not a faint path through a dangerous wild or, or a tightrope where one misstep, I'm going to fall to my doom. I think a better model here is something much safer, something much friendlier, something much more fun, like a fenced-in playground. Okay, see the fence would represent God's moral will, right? Don't step outside the fence. But within the boundaries, I am free to play. I can climb the slide, I can do the merry-go-round, I can do the teeter-totter. I can play in the sandbox. I don't have to worry about which one I choose because they're all within the boundaries that God's given me. There's freedom within parameters. Make sense? Okay. So we see this concept at play way back in the Garden of Eden. Look again at Genesis chapter 2. We're just going to look at verses 15 through 17 here. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And here's what he says. The Lord God commanded him, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what do we know about Adam in the garden? Not a whole lot, actually. The Bible doesn't spend a whole lot of time in the Garden of Eden. We know that God gave Adam some simple instructions. He commanded that Adam work the garden and feed himself with whatever looked good. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was off limits. So those instructions, those parameters, were God's will for Adam. Right? 
They created a context in which Adam could make decisions and he could express himself within those parameters. So Adam received enough information that he could make good judgments. He was responsible to act without being micromanaged. His moral development progresses just like ours. We were to, he was to obey God's instructions and then reason from them using logic and application to apply them to his daily decisions. So a model might work something like this, okay? First step, we're faced with a choice and the very first question I need to ask myself is, is this a decision covered by a clear command from scripture? Does scripture say something very clearly about this? If the answer to that question, yes, clearly scripture does say something very clearly about this, then just obey the command, right? But when I get the, when I get, when I answer no to that question, no, the Bible doesn't clearly have a specific scripture about this. That's when things get a little bit more complicated, right? So should I be an investment banker or a bank robber? Scripture's probably pretty clear on that one, right? Thou shalt not steal. Okay, that one's easy. However, if I'm not sure, I have to go through a very difficult process. I have to study Scripture for clarification on this issue. And this can be a lengthy process of examining the Bible, not for proof texts, but for, for patterns of biblical values. Because some people might go, well, the Bible says don't steal. It doesn't actually apply that to don't be a bank robber. I could probably weasel around that a little bit and, and figure out a way that I could justify being a bank robber. No, no, no. You're applying principles to your choices. Make sense? All right. This is what we've been talking about for the last three weeks. We have to develop a worldview that thinks and perceives of the world the way the Bible presents it. I need to have a transformed mind that comes from immersing myself in the Word of God and letting it transform the way I think. Then I can come to a decision. And if the patterns of Scripture demonstrate clear guidance about the decision you face, then in the same way as if there was a command, thou shalt not steal, then I need to apply that as well and respond in obedience. But when the answer, so, so the first question is, is there a clear command in scripture? No. Are there clear patterns in scripture? No. Okay. Then I have to begin to apply that worldview in a more nuanced way. If my decision isn't addressed in scripture, either with a direct command or with further study for clarification, then I have to do something really hard and this is something that God expects of each of his followers. I have to learn to think and apply biblical principles to a situation that the Bible doesn't directly address. Should I retire or should I take that promotion? Which is the right choice? Is that in the Bible anywhere? No. But I need to think about that. Do I take the school in Missouri or do I take the school in California? I need to think about that. But I'm not going to be able to flip open to a book in the Bible and point to a verse and have it answer my question. So what do I do? That's hard. So I do this by analyzing those options, right? I process it through that biblical worldview. I pray for discernment and I, I pray with an attitude that will submit to God's sovereignty. I, I think about biblical teaching that may come from relevant areas. What do I do with my money? What is my responsibility to my family? What would my role and obligations to the kingdom of God look like in these circumstances? And I try and balance those things in a way that makes sense. And here is honestly the place where your personal desires get a say in things. You're allowed to go, you know what, California sounds pretty cool. Or go, you know what, I, I don't think I can handle California. The, the taxes are just crazy. I'd rather go be in Missouri because maybe that's closer to family or whatever. You're allowed to have that, that, that um, way into your decision making. And you can seek counsel, wise friends of mentors. You, you, these, these kinds of considerations, you need to weigh them. But really understand at this point, there's not a wrong answer. There's just two different right answers. And that's a lot more comforting, isn't it? I can breathe a lot more easily when I go, I got, I got two choices. Which one do I want better? Which one do I want more? 
Not, oh my gosh, if I choose one of these, if I choose to go to California, I'm going to wreck my life. And then once you've made a decision, you know, just go for it. Prayerfully proceed. Be open to the idea that God's going to give you some more information you didn't have before, and it might change your mind. But God wants us to be free, to be ourselves, to be the people that God made us to be within the boundaries of his moral will. So when we're faced with a choice where we have two or more options that all seem to fit within the moral will of God, then we're free to use our brains and follow our hearts. We don't need to feel like we're taking a pass-fail test that I didn't study for. And then let's just imagine for a minute that I do somehow choose wrongly. Take comfort. Always remember that God's grace is sufficient even for my foolishness. God's mercy covers even that. The old hymn, we sang it just a few minutes ago. Be still, my soul. Thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. My hope, my confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. God is good. Why do we act like he's not? Why do we, why do we get ourselves so concerned that God is, is just waiting for a reason to hit that smite button on his computer? God's going to bring about his desires for our lives, even though our faith may falter and our choices may on time, from time to time be foolish or, or tainted by selfishness. He's promised to do these things because that's who he is. And if we're just going to remain faithful in the little moments of our days, how can we be anywhere but in the center of his will in the days to come? The will of God is to bear his image well. The will of God is to be reconciled to him through the blood of Christ. It is to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can think God's thoughts after him in whatever we do and discern what I should do in this, in this moment. But I can only do that by choosing to obey what he's clearly laid out in Scripture as his moral will for us. I leave his sovereign will to him, and I seek in the midst of that to fall on the grace and mercy of a God who loves us. So maybe we can just breathe a little bit. Cheer up, church. You are worse off than you think. Don't despair. Grace is near. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are, uh, <laughs> we, you are so great and merciful and loving and kind, and we can't fathom it because in our own sin and failure, we, we, we only see danger. We see you and we rightly fall on our faces in the face and the presence of a holy God whose holiness should rightly judge our sin. But because of what you have done, You've reconciled us to yourself. Your, your, your blood has washed us clean of that sin, and now we stand before you justified and whole and, and made righteous, not through anything we have done, but because of what you have done. And because of that, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And we can stand there and know that you love us and that you have nothing in store for us but what is for our good, even though in the midst of the circumstances it may be difficult, it may be painful, it may be hard to see but you have given us your, your spirit and have equipped us to obey and serve you in a way that pleases you and glorifies you, which is the chief end for which you created us. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your mercy and your grace, and we ask that you would help us to relax and look up at you and understand who you are, that you loved us enough to die for us so that we would not have to face your wrath but that we would be embraced and welcomed as your sons and daughters. And that we are free to choose to do things that please you and to delight in them if they delight us. We thank you for all these things, we pray. In Christ's most holy name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. I know I needed to hear that today. Please rise for our closing hymn, number 405, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord.
and receive the benediction. As you go from here, may you go in the, the comfort and knowledge that God has revealed his word, his will to you already. You don't need to find it. It's clear in his word. That you may go with peace of knowing that God's grace extends even beyond my foolishness and my shortcomings and my failures. And that the future is in his hands and he will guide you there just as surely as, as, as he has guided you here to this place today. Now, my friends, may you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To God be the glory both now and forevermore. The service is ended. Go in peace.